Hi again, I'm Diego Martinez, and this is Tunes, a podcast about the songs we vibe to. As you know, this is the home of underrated music anthems, their story and their legacy, as told by the people involved in the creative process behind them. Today, we're joined by legendary vocalist Corey Day. We'll talk about her work with Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band, and most specifically, their timeless hit from 1976, Cherche La Femme. With the headsets and the orchestrations and the modern air singing in the background, I felt like I was listening to a song that I was already playing, if that makes sense. I kind of like had a moment where I was separated from my body. I said, wow, this is coming out of you? Oh my gosh, this is amazing. I just feel that these kids from the Bronx, everyone's going to relate to us and our music. And I think as long as it's played in the home and there's children around, it's going to keep going on and on and on. Americans spent the summer of 1976 celebrating the nation's bicentennial. The nightmares of two decades of the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal just a couple of years before now seemed like long-distant memories, as streets all over the country filled with images of stars and stripes, cookouts, and fireworks. Stadium rock provided the background music for the festivities. Many bands, including the Eagles, Fleetwood Mac, Leonard Skinner and Kiss experienced great success during this period with a sound that only two decades before was thought of corrupting the country's youth. But another sound was creeping from under the surface, threatening to take over Rock's crown and anything else in sight. 1976 was the year when disco was hot. Straight out of the Black, Hispanic, and gay neighborhoods in Philly and New York, disco exploded all over the world throughout this year, from London and Munich to Moscow and Amsterdam. It inspired the opening of multiple clubs ready to welcome dancers, keen on trying out the latest moves like the hustle or the bump. While Donna Sommer, Barry White, Gloria Gaynor, and the Soul Soul Orchestra churned out the genre's early classics, you'd also find the oddball novelty records in the shelves. From the overtly set sea, More, 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 by former porn queen Amanda True Connection, to the downright silly Disco Duck by radio DJ Rick Dees. Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah band was neither overly set sea nor silly, and in fact, they weren't even disco although their carefree lyrics and tight, danceable musicianship fit beautifully with the times. Founded by brothers August Darnell, a.k.a. Kid Creole, and Stoney Broder Jr., Dr. Buzzards drew influences from the big band and swing eras, as well as the worlds of soul, Latin, jazz, and world music, to come up with a fresh and lush fusion, ready for the funky feet. At its very core was the sensual, silky, and exuberant voice of singer Corey Day, who was more than happy to stay in the background and let the man call the shots of the band. That was, of course, until they buckled under pressure, and Corey had no choice but to step out front, give life to August's lyrics of the tragic mulatto and Stoney's dazzling arrangements, and in the process, create one of the most enchanting postcards of the early disco years. Corey herself deserves much credit for the lead and background stylings captured on Che Che La Femme and the rest of their self-titled debut album for RCA, a cult record for generations of listeners everywhere. The genesis of Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band can be traced in the streets of the South Bronx in New York where Corey, August, and Stoney grew up. 
all of them share the experience of watching the glamorous Hollywood stars on the small screen, an image that fed their fascination of a bygone era. When I was very young, I was um, exposed to musicals on Million Dollar Movie, and there was The Late Show and The Late Late Show, <laughs> and we, there were all the, you know, television was in its early stages, and they licensed movies from Hollywood. I was exposed to the gangster movies, you know, and everything was always, um, the costuming was amazing. You know, if you looked at an Astaire Rogers film, a Judy Garland film, any of the musicals, you can go on and on and on. The costumes were amazing. You know, it just takes you away. And we were a family of simple means in the South Bronx. So seeing all that glitz and glamour, that helps you form a dream. And then there were uh, times when I would see Ella Fitzgerald and I identified with her even more, even though she was singing like a tisk at a tasket, which was so bubblegum. But she was on a different uh, variety shows and. I just fell in love with her voice because it was so melodic and yet she could um, scat like nobody's business. And then there were the harmonies of the Andrews sisters that I saw in an Abbott and Costello film and I fell in love with them. And then when I got older, I would pick up their albums and do the research on their harmonies, which were so tight that, you know, be, I guess maybe because of the DNA, they all sounded like they were one person singing all parts and doubling it, which is what I did on a lot of the background vocals. Besides Ella and the Andrews sisters, there were two other singers that Corey idolized while growing up. She could relate to the sound quality and painful life story of both Billie Holiday and Judy Garland. Many years later, Corey incorporated their sentiment into some of Dr. Buzzard's most sophisticated songs. Billy, she sang from her soul, from deep within, uh, from all the pain that she was exposed to. Nobody has an easy life when they enter the entertainment business. You know, when you have that dream and you're struggling. I mean, we struggled for a couple of years, so thank God it wasn't too long. <laughs> but between leaving home and having the RCA deal, there was a lot of struggle, a lot of pain, a lot of emotional upset. And I just related to all the pain that she went through and, all the, and hers was pretty heavy. And yet she was able to have a smile on her face. She was able to, to sing. She did sing some happy songs, but once that, like when I, I pulled from her energy on hard times, because there's the admitting that these times are hard, we're in a lot of pain, but as long as we have each other, love conquers all. So kiss me. And then also when I would have fun and sing out, you know, I would pull from Judy Garland because she was another one who had a painful life and yet she was able to sing these happy songs and belt it out and, and be amazing. So it was just a combination of these amazing women that were my predecessors. Corey's childhood fantasies became a reality at the start of 1970. She was attending an all-girls straight school with the aim of going to college. In her free time, she would hang out at the nearby James Monroe High School, where her brother took classes. It was there where she heard about the notorious Broder brothers, who already had a reputation to uphold. While taking part in a children's production of The King and I, Corey locked eyes with the elder Broder, Stoney, and the two became inseparable. When I met Stoney, instead of hanging out with the kids in the backyard or, you know, on the corner or going, you, we didn't have malls. So, <laughs> but, you know, instead of hanging out with the other kids, we were in his room with his tap piano and just banging away and singing. And that's when the dream started again and it became a goal. So it was after I met him. 
Stoney and August got their feet wet, musically speaking, as members of a band called The In-Laws, later renamed Unum Mundo. Corey would later join The In-Laws, performing backing vocals and occasional duets. Their love for the 30s and 40s went beyond the music. They were developing an image to match. We did research music. We would buy albums and albums and albums for dating back to the 30s and just, you know, listening to everyone, including the current artists of the time that we thought were legends and timeless, like Ray Charles, his phrasing, Betty Carter, the softness of her voice and her jazz influxes. We just went on and on and on, all the swing bands. And then when uh, Stoney and I we're walking down Broadway near Waverly Place. We happened upon a, a place that had vintage clothing, and I just fell in love with it. And we just, he, he did as well. And we bought them out for the band. We bought up all the clothes, and it was a part of our lives even before we went into the studio. The whole concept and image, everything that we wanted was forming and gelling and getting put together. I was doing reference vocals at the time. I was not the lead singer of the band by no means uh, when they formed and we were doing the college circuit and we were doing, you know, the upstate Chitlin circuit. And I was never the lead singer. I was always the background singer. So I was just doing reference vocals with him so we could get the melody down. August would write the lyrics and then we would perform them. We did a lot of standards because that was expected of us at the time. So it wasn't until we cut the album that we did all original material. Stoney wanted more. He figured, you know what, if we're going to start anywhere, we're going to have to start at the top. So let's just stop this madness of performing here and there, focus on the music and the auditioning for the people that can get us a record deal. And that's when we started, stopped performing and started focusing on original material. The ensemble was polishing its sound and at the same time, changing its name. Out when the in-laws and in came a mouthful that, as a matter of fact, was a tribute to Stony Browder Jr.'s Southern roots. Well, his parents were from the South, and Dr. Buzzard was a fictitious character who used to sell elixirs. You, you know, they used to sell what was called snake oil, and uh, the elixirs was supposed to take care of any of your maladies, physical maladies. And so... That was also in tribute to his father. Stoney's father he was the one who drove us to the gigs and he was, uh, he was also a guitar player. He taught Stoney how to play guitar and um, the piano was self-taught, but he taught his son how to play guitar and August the bass. And so it was mostly a tribute to his dad. Yeah. <laughs> and their roots, their Southern roots. <laughs> Rebranded as Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah band, they had enlisted lead vocalist Bill Dorsey, drummer Mickey Sevilla, and percussionist Andy Hernandez, a.k.a. Coti Mundi, when opportunity knocked. Cassandra Minsky, August Darnell's girlfriend and the band's interim manager, connected them with a 25-year-old music executive named Tommy Matola, who had experience in the biz as a solo recording artist. By 1975, Motola was enjoying success handling the careers of singers and songwriters Daryl Hall and John Oates. Baby hair with a woman's eyes. Tommy Matola was working at Chapel Publishing at the time, and he had just started managing Hall and Oates. He started his management company, it was in its early stages. And he had a coworker whose name was Mark, I can't remember his last name, and uh, Susandra Minsky, that was her stage name, <laughs> was August's girlfriend at the time. And she was the one that was selling our wares, so to speak. And she went to chapel and met Mark. And Mark said, I think this Tommy Matola would be a good fit for a manager. He just started with Hall & Oates. Hall & Oates has a single that's out that's doing great. and so. She she found him and he also helped her find a couple of other people to um, 
possible managers, potential managers. And we rented a space at SIR Studios that had a stage and, you know, the whole setup, the, the sound systems and everything in the audition. And Tommy was very interested and he was gung-ho about the whole thing. And so we signed up with Tommy. Tommy was a performer. Tommy started out as a singer. So he had the musical ear, as opposed to all the white shirts that were running the music industry, who would listen to a song with dollar signs in their heads, wondering if it'll make money. He had more faith than anyone else because he had a musical background. And his business sense, along with his musical background, that marriage got him like so far in the top where he was chairman of Sony. So he saw something in us and thank God he did. She's gone. After they impressed him with a cover of Hall & Oates' She's Gone, Botolo secured a deal for the band with RCA Records and brought in famed 60s songwriter Sandy Linser to produce their debut LP. Dr. Buzzards was still in experimental form by the time they entered the recording studio, adding, subtracting, and coming up with new ideas for the album. Although the label and their manager were becoming impatient, Linzer allowed the group to continue on developing their mulatto madness sound, which coupled with light lyrics, proved to be anything but novelty. He might as well have been a member of the band. He was so into it and wasn't afraid that it was taking too long and wasn't afraid about all the pressure he was getting from RCA. You know, he just felt that this needed to happen. This needed to come out exactly the way we could see it happening as an end result. And so even Tommy came down on Sandy at some point because, you know, the pressure was trickling down from the big boys up at RCA. You know, we had full orchestrations on Sun Shower and eliminated everything except that African drum and the bass and the kids. <laughs> arms like what are you doing why are you doing this and we just kept forging ahead and he took the uh album and he took all the songs and made it sound like a record you know you have all these tracks you have to mix them in and have all the dynamics going on and it's not that easy it's not that simple it's like editing a film is the editor is the one who should be getting all the accolades I would think that the cheeky lyrics to I'll Play the Fool would be considered novelty, but the beat, the orchestrations, the music had a hard drive to it. You know, it wasn't sing-songy simple kind of stuff. So there was a great balance with the, you know, the weight of the of the, the musicality of the, of the orchestrations. And then there was the lightness, for lack of a better word, uh, levity rather, of the lyrics. And there was a great marriage there. And then the vocals waving up and down and all over it just enhanced it and just complemented everything. You know, that was the fusion as well. There, there were so many elements of fusion regarding that band, right down to our own backgrounds and cultures. Everybody was from different parts of, not of the world, our own world, of course, but, <laughs> but we were all had different backgrounds and different cultures that we grew up with. I don't think Stoney and August grew up with Tito Puente playing in the in the in the house when I was growing up and Tito Rodriguez and Perez Prado, you know, none of that. But that was the element that made me relate to some of the Latin qualities in the songs. You pull from from what you know, and when you're exposed to so many different sounds and cultures, and then able to have that technique to to marry them all together, to meld them together, so it's fun, it's it's different, it's heavy at the same time, and um, it just worked. Yeah. In total, the group spent six months and $500,000 recording their first album, something unheard of by RCA standards. 
they were also finding it hard to keep a male lead vocalist in place. After the departure of Bill Dorsey and another singer named Gitchy Dan, they even tried to recruit a young Luther Vandros after watching a McDonald's ad with his voice on it, but he declined the offer. Dr. Buzzards was getting pressured on all fronts, and all patients had worn thin. Four months into the recording, a reluctant Corey stepped out of the background to sing on a track written by August and named after a popular French phrase that literally translates to look for the woman. On her first ever studio recording as a lead vocalist, she channeled the phrasing of a soul music giant and gave an unforgettable performance that surprised her and forever associated her with the song. It took a, a little while for me to figure out what kind of approach do I want to um, use? Who do I want to pull from? And of course, it was Philippe Wynn of the Spinners. One of a kind, love affair is the kind of love that you read about in a fairy tale. I heard his voice and fell in love with his phrasing. I would see him at the Apollo Theater. Stoney and I would sneak in <laughs> and we would. We were just floored by this man who had a beautiful melodic voice, but the staccato and the way he sang is, and then, and then ad-libbing at the end with notes. He didn't ad-lib with a scat, he used words. And that to me was like the most amazing thing. I mean, and could it be I'm falling in love at the end? I'm going out with my heart in my hand. Hey. Uh, <laughs> And then I said, I'm, uh, guys, can I, can I try something? Can you, can you just shut the lights and give me the headsets, put in all the orchestrations and just let me try this. And when, after whispering, the intro to whispering, and I started, Tommy Matola, there you go. I got Felipe it down, baby. <laughs> That was August. August wrote the lyrics, but uh, I, there was somebody else's name, and I have no idea. I cannot even remember that, and and whose idea it was to say Tommy Mottola. I think that was more of a tribute to him. I do know that it was more of a tribute to him and to immortalize his name. We didn't know that he was going to be the CEO or chairman of Sony, but <laughs> but we did want to. That was our way of thanking him for all that he had done for us. And I was like, what is coming out of my mouth? I was like, what is this? And it felt like with the headsets and the orchestrations and the modern air singing in the background, I, I felt like I was listening to a song that I was already playing, if that makes sense, with the vocal. And I, so I, I, I kind of like had a moment where I was separated from my body. And <laughs> it was just exhilarating. It was amazing. I said, wow, this is coming out of you. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. song it's cheeky you know look for the woman and the woman is like really um i think they're saying that cherche la femme is a derogatory expression now to women and i just don't believe that i think it's a woman coming into her own and taking over and if you got a problem with that okay <laughs> it's all right <laughs> if a man has a problem with that okay say cherche la femme yes it's because of the woman all right so i just find it that my delivery is just as cheeky as the lyrics you know and so i don't have that shock that i had when i after getting after the album was released and i would play the whole album at home and and just still be in awe of the accomplishments that i made on each song because it
RCA Records executives were dumbfounded when they finally heard the finished Dr. Buzzard's album. Without a way to pigeonhole the LP or the band, RCA was willing to shelve it entirely or release it and use it as a tet write-off. Ultimately, they released it with artwork designed by Doc Johnson and with zero fanfare. Corey credits the gay community on Fire Island for embracing the album before anybody else and spreading the love throughout underground clubs and radio stations. Tommy had the foresight to hire Ray Caviano, the Caviano brothers who had a promotion company. And they said, let's take this product to Fire Island. You don't have to promote it, but the band should be there. We walked there, got off the ferry and was in a whole different world in the Pines. Every house we passed was playing a different cut of that album. And we were in awe. You know, you're on this little boardwalk and nothing but foliage around you. And, 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 and the houses, the little houses spotting the place. And it was just uh, the most amazing experience. And that's when it started to bubble. When Fire Island and all the boys came back from Fire Island, it hit the radio, it hit the clubs, it hit everything. So it was just a massive outbreak. And we had a Grammy nomination by the end of the year. People would bring that music home with them. It didn't just stay in the clubs. You know, they brought the album home with them. So their children, their grandchildren, it just went on and on for generations, which, and decades. I consider that album to be a classic. And I'm not speaking about my vocals. I'm talking about the album itself, the quality of the orchestrations, which were all live and not techno. The melodies, the lyrics. I mean, those lyrics were nothing like what was popular in the disco era, so to speak. You know, it wasn't like ABC or anything like that. So it endured the test of time, I believe, because it had a lot of validity throughout the generations. And identity, a lot of people identified with the songs. The single for Che Che La Femme peaked at number 27 on Billboard's Hot 100 in 1976 and reached the very top of the disco charts. It also charted high in Canada, Belgium, and the Netherlands. A year later, Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best New Artist, but was beaten by vocal quartet Starland Vocal Band. After the LP reached number 22 on the album's charts, Corey and the boys became the talk of the town at Studio 54, and all the daytime and variety shows on TV, where producers went all out to create lavish sets, especially for them. It's an unusual combination, and they're an unusually talented group, and they have a most unusual name. Please welcome Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band. Dinah was up first, and her co-host was Sean Connery. Ah! Oh, he was my idol. I mean, this was 007 on the damn show with me, and I was... Uh, <laughs> and But they had a live audience. So the live audience, they, you know, I think they had to pick their jaws up off the floor after we finished our song. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, they were older people. You know, this is a daytime show, and the kids are in school, and so <laughs> they... Um, they were pretty much older people, and I'm riding up and down the side of a piano. They were like, what is this? Oh, But what struck me was they did their homework, with, I guess the people that produced the show, and we had the bandstands. The guys in the band weren't really playing, but our background singers were in the bellhop outfits, and they went all out with uh, the imagery of what we were projecting. Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band. Tony Orlando was pretty much the same. He had a live buzzard when he introduced us. And Paul Anka did even more. He like he went all out and he gelled the lens and had the, the dancers and, and palm trees. And all of the shows that we were on just made it so that it would complement our image. RCA promoted Dutcher Buzzards as a disco band and placed them in that department under executive Tony King. Though they had experienced success, 
their club presence was limited due to the size of the band. They released a second LP, Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band meets King Panet, which peaked at number 36 on the album's charts. Although several cuts made it to the dance charts, none of them crossed over to the pop market. With time, the band's relationship with RCA became more and more complicated. We were labeled as disco because Show Show was danceable and in the clubs, and I'm grateful for that. But after listening to the album, you would know we are not a disco band. It's danceable, but it's not disco. But that was fine. That was fine because everybody was getting pigeonholed at the time anyway. There was no such thing as fusion or pop, or it was just, uh, it was an R&B or rock or disco, or, and that was it. And so we had a great relationship with Tony King. He tried to push us. We, we, the only thing RCA did not back us up with was live performances because our band was very, very large and they wouldn't find venues for us that could afford us because we had horns and we were going to be 11 to 17 piece band. So that wasn't happening. And clubs never had live, but anytime clubs had a live performer, they sang to tracks and we, we kind of refused to do that. We did not want to, we were a band. If we can't promote, okay, we already got the gold record. We already got the Grammy nomination. Let's restart and negotiate for the second album. We felt that after the second album, if it's successful, we can call the shots. We can get find our own venues and anybody will pay anything to see a live band, a large orchestral band. That was the goal. Unfortunately, <laughs> it did not happen. Back then, if you were labeled as disco, your first song should sound like the second. And our second song, our second album was nothing like the first. We thought that we would have, a, a, our fan base was ready for something different. We didn't take into consideration that our fan base were some, a lot of people that didn't necessarily buy the album, but they loved dancing to the song in the clubs. And so we took it a step further, maybe too soon. For us, it was not too soon because the third album was even way out, out there more than the second. Tommy Mottola broke all management ties with Dr. Buzzards before the release of their 1979 LP, Dr. Buzzards' original Savannah Band Goes to Washington. At the same time, Corey's relationship with Sony had also fallen apart. Out of self-preservation and citing personal reasons, she decided to leave the group for good to embark on a solo career. It was just time. There were some personal issues that could have been resolved, but I just thought it was time to leave. I just felt it was like beating a dead horse. So let me just move on. And I did continue to do some vocals for them. I was contracted to do vocals. I did. But um, August was forming his band Kid Creole. There was a lot of dissension within the band and that happens a lot. I had my own personal issues and I just felt this is it. This is time for me to, to just be on my own and hold my own. Can I do it? Can I do something on my own without a band? Because I'm a band member. I've always been a band member, even starting out as a background vocalist. Can I be a solo artist? Even though I was singing solo, I was still a band. <laughs> Um, so the first song I sang on that, on my solo album was Sing Over Again. From then on, I was just free. I was free and happy and it was great. And I still contracted with the band to do their albums. So it was fine. I'm single again, single again. Tell me what's been going on here. Is the party about to end? Single Again was included on Corey's debut solo album from 1979, Corey and Me, produced by Sandy Litzer. It also featured songs like Pow Wow and the Dutch top 20 hit Wiggle and Giggle All Night. August Darnell and Andy Hernandez went out to form the successful Kid Creole and the Coconuts, while remaining members of Dr. Buzzards, including Corey on vocals, carried on and recorded a fourth and final album in 1984, Calling All Beatniks. Stoney Browder Jr., who collaborated on Kid Creole albums, died from complications due to a stroke in 1991.
Corey Day also worked on Kid Creole projects, including a tour with them in the late 80s. She's planning to return to the stage with a live band and perform to her adoring fans, and is actually working on new music recordings, which she hopes to release later in 2022. A Legends of Vinyl Hall of Famer, and a regular on the disco balls for the past seven years, Corey is proud of the work she did with Dutter Buzzard's original Savannah Band, which has been sampled by A Tribe Called Quest, Buster Rhymes, M.I.A., and Ghostface Killa, among other hip-hop and rap artists. She trusts that the mulatto sound of the kids from the South Bronx will continue to pass from generation to generation and endure the test of time. I just feel that these kids from the Bronx, everyone's going to relate to us and our music. And I think as long as it's played in the home and there's children around, it's going to keep going on and on and on. It's a domino effect. And it's not through me. It's maybe because of our music, but it's because of the people who are appreciating it. As long as that continues, it's gonna go on for decades ahead. History repeats itself. That's why disco is back, even though it's not called that. History always repeats itself. Fashion, everything, how far can you go with, with uh, eight letters, you know, and so many beats, you know? It's like you have the scale and that's it. And then you have so many different beats and that's it. And so you can make all these different, it's like the lottery. You have just a certain amount of numbers. How many combinations can you come up with? Our combination was a winner and it's going to stay a winner for the rest of my life and many more to come. Thanks to Corey Day for her contributions to this episode. And thanks to all of you for listening. This episode was produced and hosted by yours truly, Diego Martinez. Our executive producer is Nicholas Nick Fresh Puzo. And our audio engineer is Adam Fogel. Follow Tunes all over social media. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TunesPod. That is C-H-O-O-N-S-P-O-D and become part of our community on Patreon, where you can find early access to our content, after-show discussions, and much more, starting at $5 per month. Go to patreon.com slash tunespot. Don't forget to rate us and give us a review on Apple Podcasts, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We will return for another deep dive into the context and longevity of the songs that form the fabric of our lives on the next episode of Tunes. Tunes.